Uh, well, I'm Richard Sarebji. I'm um, uh, an honorary fellow of Wolfson College, Oxford, and I, um, I'm a jack of all trades. Um, my first enthusiasm ever was Aristotle, but I went beyond that, so I now do a lot of the history of Western philosophy and smatterings of Islamic and Indian philosophy and all, all branches of the subject, so jack of all trades. But uh, perception in Aristotle was one of my very first subjects. And so I was absolutely delighted with, with Anna's book, and it has uh, three topics in it. Uh, the one I'll talk about is how from perceiving properties to get the idea of perceiving objects in the external world. But I'm also very interested in perception as powers. I think what she says is very valuable. And there's a bit in the middle about subjectivity, which will be slightly relevant to what I say. Now, um, it, near the end of the book, um, for those who want to page 264-5, she says that the, the topic of the book has been um, Aristotle's resolution of the question how one manages to perceive objects, uh, presumably in the external world, uh, from merely seeing properties like um, colour and texture or shape and size. How does one move from the properties to the objects? Um, well, uh, she comments that Aristotle um, doesn't need to say that by perceiving objects like size and shape, which can be perceived by more than one sense, he, he doesn't need to say that one's first got to be aware of, of colour and texture as belonging to the same object. One doesn't need to know, Aristotle doesn't need to say, uh, that you need to know about external objects in order to, in order, um, uh, to perceive and recognise shapes sizes, motion, rest, number, which are all perceptible by more than one sense. Now, what I'm going to do is to suggest that perhaps it ought to go the other way around. I think it's quite right for uh, that Anna distinguishes with Aristotle between qualities perceptible by only one sense, colour, flavour, um, odour, um, uh, um, taste, hot and cold, wet and dry, each perceptible by only one sense, and the qualities or properties perceptible by more than one sense, the common properties, as Aristotle calls them, size, shape, number, motion, rest. Uh, that's an important distinction. Because imagine, think of an infant, supposing a, a, an infant were um, just perceiving the colour, uh, flavour, odour, those ones. Well, one might think... Um, what reason is there for an, uh, an infant to think this is more than just so many sensations? Um, why should it think about an external object at all? Now, the common objects of perception, that is to say, size, shape, number, motion, rest, and unity, those are very much more complicated because there are many manifestations of, let us say, shape, which go together. There's felt shape, the scene shape. There is um, rolling along a flat surface, which indicates it's flat rather than bumpy. Uh, and this rolling may be seen, felt, or heard with, with all the bumps. It also takes a particular form um, across a wavy surface. You don't, you don't see a ball, um, its bottom half disappearing in the peaks and reappearing in the troughs. No. Uh, the ball uh, goes up and down in what we eventually recognise as also being a wave if the surface is a wavy surface. All these different um, manifestations of shape seem to go together in a conjunction. That's very unlike colour, odour, uh, where there's just one type of manifestation. And so this highly intellectual baby 
uh, that we're imagining, and soon I'm going to dismiss this baby, <laughs> this highly intellectual baby, would have to think to itself, now wait a moment, this is a little bit more complicated. Why is it that there's a very complicated conjunction of sensations I get when I look at this, um, or, or, or feel this, or hear this, uh, other group of properties? This very intellectual baby would have to say to itself. But even though being so intellectual, this baby realizes there's a difference, why should that lead it to think uh, that the difference was there were some external objects? What has that got to do with external objects? It just it has some sensations which are simple and some sensations which go in very uh, t tightly grouped bundles. Where's the external object come in so far? Now, I have a th feeling that natural selection, for very, very good reasons, has wired babies so that they are born um, noticing first and foremost objects. It takes quite a long time for them to um, distinguish colours. Objects first. Um, the, 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 the baby... Um, uh, the baby's got to do quite a lot of things first, I think. Uh, one thing it's got to do first is this. It's got to know that there is one being that is both perceiving the colour and perceiving the texture. If this highly intellectual baby knew there has been a perception of colour and there has been a perception of texture, but no idea that it's the same self, indeed itself, that has got both, then it's got nowhere near appreciating that it's an external object which has both. Uh, it doesn't prove there's an external object which has a, a colour and texture uh, if one party has seen some colour and a completely different party has seen texture. So it's first got to have some very rudimentary idea of, of, of there being one single perceiver it, it itself. Very rudimentary. But also, the baby responds to things like the mother's smile. It doesn't respond to the shape of that smile if it's scribbled on a wall. It responds to the mother's smile. Now, that's only a tiny little bit of the mother's body, but it does respond to the smile or frown. And indeed, in the very first few months, it does incredibly sophisticated things about external objects. It's got to, natural selection insists, it's got to distinguish between I am approaching this object and this object is approaching me. The babies do that very early. I, I wrote down somewhere when they did that. I've forgotten whether it's four months or what it is. It's very, very early. And just as well, you see, because if I'm approaching an object, that's one thing. But if an object is approaching me, that might be extremely dangerous. And so natural selection has decided that babies very early on are going to make the distinction between their approaching the object and the object approaching them. So I think it's first got to be, for natural selection reasons, all about objects, and all, also about objects in relation to the self. A very, very rudimentary idea of self. I, I was saying over lunch that I think the first psychological idea of self uh, is thought to come at nine months by uh, child development studies. But this is much earlier. A sort of bodily view, bodily picture of self. And I think only then w would the baby be likely to be in a position, as far as I can see, to think, oh, all these manifestations of self, uh, sorry, of shape, I beg your pardon, all these manifestations of shape um, go together to form one quality of shape. That seems to me, even for my intellectual baby, quite a sophisticated thing to think. They are extremely unlike each other, these sensations of shape. Very sophisticated thing to think. Not vital for the purposes of natural selection, not, not as vital as the mother's smile or whether something's approaching you or you're approaching it. So I think it should be the other way round. That Aristotle ought to have said, although and is absolutely right, he doesn't say. Uh, he doesn't say. But he ought to have said that first the baby wants to know that there are external objects and natural selection makes sure that it does know that first, and what their relation, uh, bodily relation is to itself, nothing psychological yet, what the bodily relation is to itself, otherwise it won't 
get on in the world. Uh, I think that's all I'll say, because I think we're only picking up one subject each. Um, and I did think what Anna said was extremely interesting, and it was a way of, of, of making a lot of what Aristotle stresses, because he, more than anybody before him, um, stressed these common objects like size, shape, motion, rest, and unity in number. Um, but I think it's one of the things that um, he got the wrong way round. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, so um, I'm next. My name is Roland Stout. I'm a um, lecturer in philosophy at UCD Dublin. Um, I work on philosophy of action largely, but also the philosophy of mind, philosophy of perception. Um, and I'm influenced by Aristotle. So I'm not an ancient philosopher, but I'm influenced by a remarkable fact, which is a fact which in a way underpins the value of uh, Anna's book, which is that we still have a lot to learn from Aristotle about action and perception. Um, <clears throat> it's remarkable because it means that philosophy in the intervening 2,000 years has largely um, gone wrong and that we need to go back to Aristotle to find out why and to, re to recover from it. So with respect to perception, um, Anna is clear that it's a causal process and I'm sure um, depending on how one understands that, that's right. When we're perceiving the world, we're being affected um, by it. But the way that that causal process has been understood um, in, by philosophers from the modern period onwards um, has led to certain problems for philosophy. Um, so this conception is of events, conception of, of causation as separate events with a causal link between them, a link of some kind of necessity, for want of a better word. And if you apply that to perception, you get a model where you have events happening in objects in the world, like a, a balloon pops, an event happening in a subject, an impression, an experience of some sort, and some mysterious causal relation between them. And of course, this has caused problems for philosophers because, I mean, essentially, scepticism is the biggest problem, because in terms of what's happening with the subject themselves, um, things could be just the same if there wasn't a balloon popping out there in the world. So this causal relation isn't, if you like, uh, embedded within human experience, but is outside of it. And a lot of people now think that that's a disastrous picture and that maybe if we go back to Aristotle we can find a, a way to, to save ourselves from it. So Aristotle provides us with the possibility of thinking of perception as a process um, involving a subject becoming sensitive to the world around them. And this would be a process that can't be broken down into these separate, separable stages, um, some of which involve the subject and not the object, and, and the other involves the object and not the subject. But somehow we've got an, an overall process of the subject becoming sensitive to the world. Now, <clears throat> Aristotle's conception of what such a process is sounds very simple, but it's, um, has been thought to be quite obscure by a lot of philosophers, and, and simply not really understood by a lot of modern philosophy. So it's the idea that a causal process is the actualization of a power or a potentiality. Anna likes to call these powers in a way which actually I'm not completely happy with, but I'll call, I'll call them powers too. Now power is a real property of a thing describable in terms of the structure of changes characteristic of it. So for example, solubility is the power of a substance to undergo certain characteristic changes dissolving in, in um, certain circumstances. When that power is fully present, fully realised, all its operational or enabling conditions are satisfied, it is in the process of being actualised or realised. What this means is that these stages, these, these changes that characterise it are unfolding. The substance is dissolving. Now the central difference between this and the modern conception um, is that for the moderns, those characteristic stages are all that the causal process consists in. That's all there is. Um, whereas in the ancient model, there's something else unifying these stages. It's the power, and, and the power being actualized. Um, that, I think, is going to have some significant um, effect on how we think about perception, as I'll try to explain. 
Now, according to Anna's reconstruction of Aristotle's model, there are two sets of powers in the case of perception. This is something that she's very keen to stress. There are the powers of the objects and the powers of the subjects. Um, perception is the coming together of these two powers. An object's visibility, for example, combines with my power to see things, my sightedness, resulting in my seeing the object. So the changes that characterise the power of visibility in an object um, are the changes, th those changes are changes in me, changes in a perceiving object. And this applies not just to the property of visibility to itself, but also to particular properties like redness, particular visible properties. So redness is a power characterised by the changes that it, it will, that the receiving object, namely me, the patient, will, will undergo. Um, now this idea is spelt out in terms of a reading of Aristotle's conception of causal processes that I have personally been struggling with ever since I, I started reading the book which was, um, I don't know when, back in Rome about half a year ago Anna claims that all such processes are the combinations of the realisation of an active power in the cause and a passive power in the thing affected so when one thing acts on another, there's not just the power in the agent being actualized, but there's also power in the patient being actualized. So when a sugar cube dissolves in water, there are two powers being actualized together. The power of the water to dissolve soluble things, and the power of the sugar to dissolve in solutes. In the case of perception, the perceived object is the agent, and the perceiving subject is the patient. The language is getting a bit confusing here, but this will be the perceived object. So this is the agent of the causal process. Um, I am the patient. I am, I am being affected by it. So the power, we've got two powers being realized simultaneously, one in the, in the visible object and one in me. One is the power to be seen and the other is the power <coughs> to, to see, if you like. Now this raises a central question for Anna and others working in this area. And this is where I struggle, so so far I'm very happy with it. The question is, what is the relationship between the actualizations of these two powers? Now, there are two possibilities. The first is that there's just one process going on here, the actualization of a combined power that belongs to the agent and the patient combined. And the second possibility is that there are two processes going on here, the process of the agent acting and the process of the patient undergoing changes. So there's the, the visible thing being visible and there's the sighted thing seeing and that these are two closely related but distinct processes. Now Anna argues for that view, the second of those two views. Um, she claims that's Aristotle's view though he himself isn't much help here because he seems to say that these processes are both different and one and the same thing. And so we have a kind of paradox and Anna's interpretation of it is to take Aristotle to be saying that the processes, the process of the patient realising its, its power and the process of the agent realising its power, are, uh, that those processes are distinct but metaphysically connected, as she puts it, in such ways that in some ways they're as good as identical. We can talk of them as one and the same thing, but they're not strictly speaking one and the same thing. When one of them happens, the other one must be happening. So we've got a relation of necessity. If one lasts a certain amount of time, the other one must last exactly the same amount of time. So these processes, while strictly speaking distinct according to Anna, um, are very closely related, metaphysically related. Um, in fact, they need each other as triggers, as enabling conditions to be getting going. So the passive process, the passive power needs the active power as an enabling condition for its realization, and vice versa. Okay, so these metaphysical necessities fall short of actual identity. Why? Well, there's a sort of fairly straightforward argument that Anna appeals to. The agent's power is in the agent, and the patient's power is in the patient. So we've got a power that's in the cup and there's a power in me. These are clearly different, so their actualizations must be different. So we can't think that... So, so I guess that's, in very simple terms, why we have to think of them as different processes, different um, two separate processes, albeit very closely related. 
But I can't help thinking that this separation of perception into two distinct, albeit closely connected, processes undoes some of the good work that Aristotle was doing for us in avoiding the problems coming out of the modern conception of causation. So a sceptic in the spirit of David Hume may challenge the claim that these processes are really metaphysically connected. Isn't there a genuine metaphysical possibility that one and the same power is actualized with a different enabling condition, i.e. that the subject's power of receiving impressions is realized by the presence of something other than the perceived object? And this is the possibility that gives a foothold to scepticism. So I'm a bit anxious about the, the um, idea that we've got an agent's power and a pa- and patient's power, and these are both realized simultaneously, and perception is somehow going on as those two things happening together, but metaphysically connected. Because I'm not sure I understand why they have to be metaphysically connected. I think a skeptic could, could put a wedge in there and say they're not really metaphysically. They don't have to be. You could have one without the other. I'm not convinced that actually it's an object's visibility as such which is being actualized when the object's being seen. That's because its visibility isn't a power to affect me in a particular way, whereas the process of its being seen by me is the realization of it's a power to affect me in a particular way. Its being merely visible just means that it can be seen by someone, but, not, but, but that, is, that is not a power that can be actualized by its affecting me. Nothing can manifest its visibility in an indeterminate way, revealing itself, but not to anyone in particular. So I think this is, this is me defending what I take to be Arie Cosman's view, which Anna criticizes in the book. Cosman takes something's visibility to be not in itself yet a power that can be actualized in a perceptual process, but merely the potential to have that power. That power is present only when the visible thing is in the presence of the sighted subject. Then there is, there is a power contained, contained in the two together. There's a real potential, if you like, once you get the two things together. But when you just have one of them, you've really got a potential for a potentiality. The power is actualized in the process of the subject perceiving the object, which can just as well be described as the process of the object being perceived by the subject. So describing the process in an active or a passive way like that, it doesn't look as if you're describing different processes. So I think that's my challenge to, to Anna's um, reading of Aristotle. I ca- can't help thinking that the real power, the thing that's being actualized in an object and in me, must be a power that's in both of us simultaneously. And that's the only way to make sense of perception as a, as a process that involves us both. Um, and I just find it a bit difficult to follow how we can have these two separate actualizations uh, metaphysically connected. And it's not quite doing the work for me, but I'm hoping that Anna's going to be expl- to explain how it is to work. Um, it's fair to say there are two aspects of her metaphysical approach which would be contradicted by this kind of Cosman view. Um, one is her claim that every property is a power. So she makes that claim, and it's a nice, it's a nice sort of piece of metaphysics. Every property is a power. Um, whereas I'm saying that these properties like visibility, they're not actually powers, they're just potentials to be powers, if you like. They're incomplete powers. But I don't think that's a real problem. I think that the power ontology can be modified to take into account properties which would be powers in certain circumstances. So if you like, they're kind of abstracted. We can abstract from a power ontology to properties which aren't themselves powers, but merely potential powers. And the second thing that's a that would be contradicted in Anna's metaphysics by that model, and presumably a second reason why she doesn't like it, um, is her view that every causal process involves an agent and a patient. So it's an agent acting on a patient. She's quite committed to that view, um, whereas this, on, on my alternative conception of perception, it's a mistake to think of it as an agent acting on a patient. After all, per- we, we're learning these days to think of perception as an active process. I'm not merely passive in, in, in perception. I'm not just the res- recipient of impressions. I'm acting on my environment. I'm looking at things. I'm feeling things. I'm manipulating things. So we might think of perception as a process that involves me as an agent, just as much as it involves me as a patient. So I'm not convinced that it's right to think of agency 
yeah, as straightforwardly agent to patient. And I'm also not convinced that causation should always be understood as something acting on something else. If you think of a, um, an object moving through space with no forces on it, um, according to Newton's first, I think, law of motion, it's just going to keep going. Um, it has the power to continue in its, in its same direction, at the same velocity, if nothing interferes. Um, a power which physicists call momentum. And the actualization of that power is its moving through space. Um, but there's nothing, there's, there aren't two things involved here. This is just something undergoing changes according to its own potentiality. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure why we have to think of all causation as agent-patient causation. That's my, my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. So I'm uh, Ophelia Dorma. I'm the Associate Director of the Institute of Philosophy in London and a researcher in philosophy of perception with maybe a special twist um, that is that I work uh, with cognitive neuroscientists. Uh, so I spend a lot of time trying to understand how um, scientists actually uh, solve the common sensible problem nowadays and I was really delighted to read Anna's book um, Maybe partly because, like uh, in Molière, Monsieur Jordan discovers that he was making prose without knowing. I discovered that uh, I was studying incidental perception without knowing I was. So it was a great pleasure and really, really stimulating. So um, I just wanted to um, isolate a very specific point uh, on the model of the perception, the common sense that uh, Anna suggests is defended by Aristotle and. I trust you on that. And I'm, I'm just interested in knowing how some of the problems that uh, neuroscientific models of common sense perception face can be solved within that model. So the model that Anna uh, recommends or stresses, along with Aristotle, to explain how we can perceive uh, shape as being common between vision and touch, is a version of what she calls the racial model. So there is a bit of the one and the many problem in the, the example of the perception of shape, because in a way shape, as Richard was stressing, is different. So it's given in a tactile way by touch, and it's given in a visu visual way by vision. So how do you put them together? One uh, suggestion, the racial suggestion, is to think about the, the commonality and the difference as the commonality and difference there is between two ratios. So one and on and half, one on two is similar to two on four, similar to two and eight, and so on and so forth. So, although on each side of the equation you have numbers which are different, a half and two quarters, um, you can sort of realize that these two things actually target the same thing. The analogy here is would be to say that there is a, a, a relation between the properties in touch and the relation between the properties of vision, which although use different properties, just target the same ratio and tells you that something in that uh, uh, relation between relations tells you that they're about the same thing. And I think it's a, a, a spectacularly clever uh, solution, not uh, so different from some of the contemporary models. But uh, there are three difficulties that these models have, so let's see whether Aristotle can deal with them. One uh, difficulty, if you buy the analogy, is to know exactly what is going on when the, the identity is realized between these two ratios. In a way, when you're faced with the num in the numerical case, you need to think about the equality. So especially if the numbers are you know, 57 and... 114 and one and a half, it might take a bit of time to just process the information and just realize. Um, but beside the time aspect, what is uh, most important is that the unity, the, that, that very number that makes the two ratios similar, is in a way hidden from the content which is given to the system. So if your common sense is given with uh, relations between some tactile properties and relations between visual properties, then it will need to do some extra work to just extract something 
which explain that they are similar. And this might not be the same format, if you follow the, the numerical example, as the initial elements. So you might bump on you know, uh, uh, non-rational numbers or, or um, decimals when you have fractions and only uh, uh, full numbers in, in, the, ratio, in the, the first um, fractions. So um, the second sort of aspect of the problem which, uh, which the ratio theory can face is to think that if there is something hidden that needs to be figured out so that you realize that shape is similar between these two experiences, then probably what is, which is unfair will not be on the same perceptual level as the two other given. So uh, one, one uh, very nice aspect of the, the theory that Anna is trying to defend is to say that in a way the common sense is not something over and above in terms of awareness. It's not a further sixth sense that brings new content on the top of the existing content delivered by the, the five senses. But here it seems that you're, the, the, the racial model is stuck in a, in a kind of dilemma. Either you buy the racial model and then the identity seems to have to be inferred and of a different format and probably not given in the same, at the same time as the two perceptual contents. Or you want it to be given at the same time and then it seems that there must be a sixth sense giving you that identity. So um, I don't know how this can be solved. A second thing that uh, scientists have realized, and which is very important when we need to think about the variety of, of contexts in which we unify sensory properties to perceive objects, as uh, Richard was uh, stressing, um, is that there are different cases. So um, indeed, audition and, and vision, for instance, can give you information about size. So pitch, for instance, low pitch, gives you the information that an object is big. Volume will do the same, loudness. Uh, and vision also provides you with, with a good understanding of size, with the distance of ob objects and so on. But what we know is that depending on the common sensible at stake, different modalities will be delivering better or worse messages. So vision is spe specifically uh, good at telling you about space. And audition is much better when it comes to time. So temporal resolution in audition is much better. And this explains why certain multi-sensory illusions work in one direction and not that well in the other direction. So um, in ventriloquism, for instance, vision dominates over audition. So the sounds that you hear tend to be attracted toward the, the localization of the visual target. But when it comes to uh, other, and that's a special illusion, uh, when it comes to some temporal illusions, then audition starts to dominate. So you can, for instance, uh, show people only one flash of light, but you play two sounds, and they report perceiving two flashes of light. In that case, the individuation through time is driven by audition and not vision. So the common sense, in a way, as, as we discover it, is much, much more um, sort of complicated than the, um, the kind of additive model which is proposed uh, uh, in Aristotle and in Anna's book. What the common sense does, uh, if there is a common sense, um, or, or, or the recruitment of sensory modalities to work together to provide perception of common sense, I should say, is also, if you want, sort of determining the weight and the importance of different kinds of information. It has a lot of what Anna uh, sometimes mentioned as a regulating or monitoring role toward the sensory information. Um, and again, so it will decide that in some context, if, if the task, the action to be performed has to do with space, let's put more weight on vision. If it has to do with time, let's put more weight on audition. And it shows all these kind of complex patterns. Now, if it's doing that again, how can, that's not something which can be done at the level of single senses. So it seems to give uh, maybe an additional uh, special power to the, um, to the common sense, but something which in a way, it's hard to reconcile with the idea that it's just explained and constituted by the special senses. Again, it's, it has a kind of meta position uh, relative to the special senses. The third and not the last point, uh, uh, which comes back to my kind of note of caution in talking about a common sense, 
is that actually uh, the perception of the unity between two uh, uh, sensory contents, when it has to do with shape or when it has to do with size, when it has to do with time and space, might be uh, A, realized in different parts of the brain. Uh, so the shape will be somewhere here and magnitude will be somewhere here, for instance, in the parietal lobe. Um, but that's not the main argument. The main argument, I mean, the main evidence is that when it comes to unifying different sensory properties and sensory contents, then we do things, again, in a very fine-grained way. So the rules which apply for the way you unify vision and touch for shape will not be the rules that you, the, for unifying vision and touch for time, for instance. So instead of a common sense, what seems to be happening is many common senses. Uh, and I wonder why Aristotle thought that all these common sensibles needed to be processed by a single one. Uh, and that's the, the, in a way, if the common sense is here to solve the problem between the one and the many, by being the one, um, maybe the, the, the account gets into problems if actually there needs to be many common senses explaining how you unify the many. So thanks. Thank you very much indeed. I, uh, I feel very grateful for the comments you all made and you touched upon so many things that uh, I think for brevity of time I'll be very, very quick. I just want to say in response to Richard, um, I think uh, you are absolutely right that you know, if we were thinking about human development, we would think of babies perceiving objects first and then maybe analysing them into properties, I guess. Um, that's just not what Aristotle is interested in. Uh, so he's thinking about how to model metaphysically um, this uh, problem of perception, and he starts from properties and then kind of, um, I want to say, develops metaphysically perception of objects out of perception of qualities. So now <coughs> this might not be a naturalistic kind of approach, but fortunately, as you stress yourself, that's um, how he ought to have gone, but he didn't go, so I don't know how to... Um, <laughs> will uh, um, put under pressure there. But um, that's an interesting point to remind ourselves of. And um, in response to uh, Roland, I want to say there was a lot of food for thought uh, in your comments. Um, three main things I wanted to say. So, um, I, so why two powers, why two manifestations, and why agent and patience? That's what I, um, I uh, took from your um, comments as a salient point. Um, so let me just start by saying that I think I think of perception for Aristotle as an instance of a causal connection, and uh, I think um, it's a very shared kind of intuition in philosophy that uh, causation uh, is an asymmetric relation, and then the question is what uh, underpins this asymmetry that we think there is in causation. So it's not a temporal kind of underpinning because um, um, uh, cause and effect uh, are simultaneous or lots of us think that way so I think that uh, distinguishing agent and patient or passive and active powers is just a good way to underpin um, this directionality that causation has at least you know, to many um, to the intuition of many um, so uh, yeah, in other work I discussed this a bit more so I think um, causation is asymmetric, is reciprocal, so the agent and the patient act on each other, but there is a dire directionality there from cause to effect. And I think, um, especially when we think of um, perception as an instance of causation, it's really useful to think of it as the uh, manifestation of two different, co two manifestations of dif or two different causal powers, because how else can we? explain a mental phenomenon and the physical phenomenon in terms of one and the same power and one and the same manifestation. I find that problematic and that's why I like better the idea that there are two powers, two manifestations, and the two powers are um, agent and patient. So I think it's a solution that uh, kind of uh, is economical in, in, in many ways. And um, Yes, there is, a, uh, there is a lot to be said for what kind of relations connect um, the manifestation of the agent's power and the manifestation of the um, patient's power, but I think this can be worked out in some metaphysical detail, and Aristotle does. But I hope that just indicates the motivation I had for following Aristotle, that I read it, read him um, that way. One thing that uh, I just want to say, um, it's true that Aristotle is not very explicit, but it's also fair to say that he does clearly say that... Um, um, uh, causing and um, oh, let's say causing and being effect, effect, affected are um, one and the same um, actuality but two in 
essence. So it's not just two descriptions, it's a bit stronger than that. And um, that's what I think other accounts such as um, Cosman failed to appreciate. Very quickly to Ophelia, I really appreciated his um, uh, challenges to um, Aristotle um, on how, you know, how would he address certain questions that now we know a lot more about from neuroscience and so on. So I want to say very briefly, the ratio model, um, Aristotle himself, so the ratio model, one thing that uh, I really like that you said uh, is that how spectacularly clever it is, and that's all to Aristotle's credit. I think the commentators have not kind of appreciated it that much, and that's what I wanted to do in the book to show that it is a clever idea, even if Aristotle himself, and I'm not sure, I thought that you thought that Aristotle endorses it positively mm -hmm. as a model, but Aristotle, I want to say, did not think that was a good model. Mm -hmm. It's just one possible way of thinking about a perception of common sensibles. But it's just um, um, one solution that he finds himself problematic, and then that's why he moves forward. But it's a clever one, very abstract, very interesting. I don't think he addresses all the... Uh, I don't think the Russian model is satisfactory, so I totally grant you that point, but I don't think Aristotle thought of it as satisfactory either. Um, another thing you mentioned, um, the common sense is not the addition of the single senses. I think Aristotle would agree with that, and that's what his uh, substance model is uh, meant to bring out. I think that, uh, like a human being, is not just the sum of the parts. Well, a motorcycle is just not the sum of the pieces, uh, but something over and above that. I think the common sense also is meant to be something over and above the special senses. It's just that um, the special senses are the channels through which um, uh, information about the world um, gets kind of uh, received by the, by the uh, perceiving subject. Um, but uh, the common sense is more than just the one plus the other plus the other. So maybe, I'm not sure I heard you correctly there, but if you meant that, the addi that Aristotle has an addi ad additive model, that's not quite, I think, how he thinks of the common sense. Now, the really interesting thing, um, uh, why one common sense when he, there seemed to be a case for saying that maybe many? I think I can only uh, sort of very briefly say I think Aristotle is very concerned about the unity of the, uh, per, you know, unity of perception in the sense that he doesn't want to think of us as having multiple centers of awareness. He, he, what he wants there to be one only, and that's why it's so emphatic about how we get from the many to the one. Uh, so um, that's his motivation, whether that captures all the nuances that uh, we now know uh, there are in perception, uh, maybe not, but it's also fair to say that this is um, you know, uh, more than 2,000 years ago, so he, he, he went a long way. Um, and, uh, uh, and one thing I really enjoyed in thinking about this topic uh, um, is how... Um, how much of a real philosopher Aristotle seems to be um, when he writes about uh, perception. So he gets started with a problem, he explores it, he comes up with some solution, and then he thinks, oh, wait a minute, there is this objection, <laughs> whether it's his own objection or some person in the class. Uh, and then he starts again, and again, and again. And so we see the, really the work in progress that um, he was struggling with, so to speak. And maybe he didn't have a final solution. That's one thing I say in the book. We don't get the final model. We don't get um, you know, the mystery solved. Um, we get two models, which if you put together, if you, the reader, put together, you get an adequate answer to the question Aristotle started with. But he himself does not explicitly combine them. And that's, again, you know, what's fascinating for me about it is... Um, um, how much we see his mind at work uh, and how much he draws in into what he was interested in. And um, I'd be delighted if other people took up the topic and um, found that um, there is a step for forward uh, uh, that um, the book falls short of. Anyways, I just want to say thank you very much indeed.